Good evening. That was the old Disney trick. It was actually only two minutes. Um, my name is Alice Knapp, and I'm president of the Ferguson Library. And welcome tonight for the last in this um, 2017 season of the Civility Series. Um, we do this series in conjunction with Hearst Media and the Dylan Schneider Group. And tonight um, we have our, our, our conclusion is Bill Emmett. And I'm going to now turn it over to Joe Pisani. Of the Dylan Schneider Group. We must have a very illustrious speaker when we have a crowded room in 94 degree weather. Thank you for coming. You know, even a cursory uh, look at the daily headlines would lead you to believe that there's something not necessarily wrong just with our country, but with the West. And uh, while most of us probably live in fear of the future, a man like Bill Emmett, who's accustomed to looking at these things globally, has a perspective on it that uh, I'm sure you'll find to be thoroughly engaging. Bill Emmett was editor-in-chief of The Economist from 1993 to 2006, and he's now a writer and consultant on international affairs. He's a regular contributor to the Financial Times in London, La Stampa in Italy, Nikkei Business in Japan, and Project Syndicate Worldwide. His new book, The Fate of the West, The Battle to Save the World's Most Successful Political Idea, surveys rising feelings of decline and resurgent nationalism in the West. He says the West is being challenged from within for good reason, having failed to deliver fairness, prosperity, and security to all citizens. Mr. Emmett explores how to restore harmony between openness and equality, the formula he describes as the world's most successful political idea. He's also the chairman of Wake Up Foundation, a charity dedicated to education and communication about the decline of Western societies. In 2016, the Japanese government awarded him the Order of the Rising Sun, gold rays with neck ribbon, for services to UK-Japan relations. Mr. Emmett spent 26 years at The Econom Economist, which he joined in 1980, working as a correspondent and editor in Brussels, Tokyo, and London, before being appointed editor-in-chief in 1993. During his editorship, The Economist worldwide circulation more than doubled, from 500,000 copies a week to 1. million. And for those of us who are former journalists, that's a mighty remarkable achievement. He has written 13 books, including the best-selling The Sun Also Sets, 2021 Vision, which is about the challenges for the 21st century, Rivals, which is about China, India, and Japan, and Good Italy, Bad Italy. He was a narrator and co-author of a documentary based on that Italian book called Girlfriend in a Coma, and then executive producer of a documentary about the European Union the great European disaster movie. Mr. Emmett was born in 1956 in London and was educated at Magdalen College, Oxford, where he studied philosophy, politics, and economics. He has honorary degrees from Warwick, City, and Northwestern Universities, and is an honorary fellow of Magdalen College. He and his wife, Carol, divide their time between Oxford, England, and Dublin, Ireland. So let's welcome him to Stanford, Connecticut. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you all very much for coming here this evening. It's wonderful uh, to be here, and I apologize for having been keeping you waiting a few moments, but at least the air conditioning is not too bad here, so I'm, I, I'm delighted that you were in comfort. Um, after such a generous um, and uh, detailed introduction. I feel, first of all, that I'm looking forward to find it out, finding out myself what it is I have to say. <laughs> but secondly, he does this such a generous introduction. Um, reminds me of a story that's told, I think it's true even, of uh, that Henry Kissinger was once asked um, by someone, Dr. Kissinger, what is it like to be famous? 
Um, and his response, it is re recorded, was that the great thing about being famous is that you can bore people <laughs> and they think it's their fault. <laughs> so, with that, I begin. Uh, I want to first of all thank Alice Knapp and the, this wonderful library for hosting us this evening uh, and hosting me in particular. I'm a former chairman of also, an also wonderful library in London, uh, the London Library. And as a result, I feel passionately that libraries are really the greatest crucibles of civilization. Not just storehouses of books, but venues in which ideas are created shared, learned, and improved in the, providing the in educational and intellectual alchemy that has made the West so extraordinarily advanced and successful. So thank you for making me feel so much at home in your crucible of civilization. I want very much to thank Joe Pisani for that introduction, but also Robert Dylan Schneider, um, who invited me here from the Dylan Schneider Group today to give this lecture, but also for having conceived this terrific idea of a series of lectures under the title Civility in the first place. And my lecture is about civility and the fate of the West. Because ladies and gentlemen, we who live in the advanced, open, democratic societies of North America, Europe and Japan are extraordinarily lucky people. Thanks to that intellectual and educational alchemy that I just described, and thanks to more than 70 years of peace between us, our societies are now wealthier, more stable, more secure than they have ever been before. The alliances that we have formed together, in Europe and East Asia especially, and the systems of international law that we have built together have been testament to the way we have replaced conflict and nationalistic competition with a belief in our common interest in stability, security, and predictability of behavior. And that has also been a major contributor to the very success that I describe. Thanks to that framework of freer trade, intellectual exchange, and collective security, we in the West are living longer and generally healthier lives. More of our citizenry are benefiting from high school and college education than ever before. In the palms of our hands, we hold computing and communication devices that once belonged only in science fiction, giving us access to information and contact with each other to a quite remarkable degree. The idea that is commonly held that our culture is somehow dumbing down, I believe to be profoundly wrong. All of the great arts, including music, literature, motion pictures, com contemporary art in all its form, are flourishing as never before. As an author of non-fiction books, I am delighted, of course, to report also that books continue to be written and to be read, or at least bought, and that even the so supposed threat of e-books to us authors has faded away. Moreover, many, especially in political circles, are prone to give the impression that, despite all these strengths, we are in fact under siege, especially in Europe, but also in the United States, from unusual and unprecedented external threats of a new and alarming nature, of terrorism, of migration, of ruthless authoritarian governments in other countries. Yet I reject this idea too. There are plenty of global challenges. For sure, whether from Islamic State or other jihadi terrorists, from Russian bullying and revanchism, above all from rising Chinese power, and certainly from the proliferation of nuclear weapons. All these things exist, and they pose all of them serious issues. But we've always been surrounded by such issues. No one who lived through the Cold War let alone the world wars of the 20th century, could surely think otherwise. The Middle East certainly is unstable, but when hasn't it been? Today's conflicts in Syria and Libya are terrible, but so was the eight-year-long Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s or the Algerian civil war of the 1990s. 
Only the form of our international threats changes, not truly the nature. As long as we preserve our alliances and work together collectively to face up to these threats, I believe we can manage and even overcome them, just as we have before. And yet, despite this very positive picture that I'm painting, we in the West are indeed in trouble. The point I want to stress, however, is that the trouble we are in is trouble of our own making. It is not the result of Russian hackers or jihadi terrorists or unfair Chinese competition. It is our fault. Something is indeed wrong, at least in the way we feel about things, perhaps often at times in the actuality too. We do feel in decline, or many do. Many in the West feel, as I wrote in my new book that uh, Joe mentioned, in a perhaps rather wild and reckless moment of alliteration, which I believe I would not have allowed through as an editor, that we are, quotes, demoralized, decadent, deflating, demographically challenged, divided, disintegrating, dysfunctional, and declining. Moreover, if we add a further D word, we can see evidence all too often that our democracies have become more politically volatile than at any time most of us can remember. Something is happening, and it is not entirely comfortable. Certainly in my country, our Prime Minister Theresa May can bear witness to this fact, having begun a seven-week electoral campaign more than 20 percentage points ahead in the polls, and then she finished it last Thursday with the loss of her parliamentary majority and, most probably, her political career. She did at least, like someone you know rather well here, beat her opponents in the popular vote, but still the outcome was a humiliation. A humiliation which leaves Britain in an extraordinary and unexpected state of uncertainty. Following just 12 months after our voters chose in a referendum to overturn more than six decades of British foreign policy and to choose to leave the European Union after 43 years of membership, this means that even our famously stiff upper lips are now quavering nervously, or possibly excitedly, depending on your political standpoint. Negotiations over this process of divorce we have come to call Brexit have been due to begin in just six days' time, although it looks like they'll be postponed. Yet we barely have a government capable of beginning that divorce, let alone agreement among ourselves as British about what sort of relationship we want with our European neighbors in future. This political volatility has, I'm sad to say, made the United Kingdom something of a laughingstock in Europe and to some degree the world. I hope that we can figure it out and turn this situation around. But make no mistake, we Brits now know what it feels like to be proud of our country but ashamed of our politics. In France, a more positive democratic earthquake has occurred with a new president, Emmanuel Macron, who is the youngest French leader since Napoleon, and whose political party looks set to win a majority in the country's parliamentary elections next Sunday by a landslide, despite having been created uh, barely more than one year ago. His republic is en marche, on the move, in the name of his new party, and we Europeans can hope that he and France will now move in a very positive and constructive direction lifting Europe's prospects on the way. And I do believe that it can. I named the chapter of this book, on our con the chapter on our continent, European Paralysis, and I do believe there is hope that France will begin to help shake us all out of that paralysis. But the fate of the West cannot be determined simply by one 39-year-old. All of these earthquakes in America, Britain, France, and perhaps soon Italy, have left many of us simply feeling the earth moving beneath our feet, potentially destroying much valued institutions as it does so. If we are to face up to this volatility and to these feelings of pessimism that are so widespread in virtually all Western countries, we need to understand why this is happening 
and we need to understand what has gone wrong. My proposition to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is that a loss of civility has a lot to do with this. The loss of civility is a symptom, however, rather than a cause, though it is a symptom of a wide-ranging character. The underlying cause in my opinion, is a neglect of some of the basic values of our democratic societies, a neglect that has arisen largely out of natural causes and natural flaws in the democratic and market process. This neglect arises out of the very good fortune with which I opened this lecture. Stability, prosperity, and progress have become a basic assumption of our lives, an assumption our grandparents generation never dared to make. With that assumption of continuous progress has come, no doubt, also rising expectations, which are bound at times to be disappointed. But a much bigger and more dangerous side effect of that assumption is complacency. We are prone to take too much of our good fortune for granted. We begin to think that the freedoms and living standards we've inherited are there as if by right. More importantly, we fail to notice the ways in which our own actions may be eroding and undermining the very bases of that good fortune before our very eyes. And then that erosion and undermining causes a huge shock. To switch metaphor, let us call this shock an avalanche, which not only risks disaster, but also overwhelms our resources, both financial and psychological, in ways that make it even harder to focus attention back onto the need to rebuild the basic values and institutions that have thereby been undermined. By that avalanche, I am, as you may well have surmised, referring to the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, the worst and most widespread financial meltdown the world had seen for 80 years. Nearly a decade later, the political volatility we are witnessing on both sides of the Atlantic bears witness both to, to the severity of the effects that that crisis had in America and Europe, but also the fact that our political systems have yet to come fully to grips with the underlying causes of our misfortune. Very often, the 2007-2008 financial crisis here in the US and the Euro sovereign debt crisis that followed it in continental Europe are seen as largely technical matters, massive policy blunders that now need to be corrected. Yet while that is partly true, it is insufficient, either as an analysis or as an explanation. In my view, the financial crisis will be seen by historians in future as being as much a political event as an economic one. That is, naturally, because of the consequent political volatility I've described, caused especially by the long period of stagnation of real household incomes and rising feeling of economic insecurity and injustice that has become entrenched in many of our countries. But also, this interpretation by historians in future will arise in a view about the political origins of the crisis itself. What do I mean by that? I mean that in any democracy, there is a natural tendency for powerful interest groups to compete to gain advantages. That is what the democratic contest is all about, after all, just like the contest in a market. But just as in markets, monopolies and oligopolies can emerge, so in democracy, great concentrations of power are capable of subverting the whole democratic process and of distorting public policy. The 2008 financial crisis was a gigantic case study of exactly that on both sides of the Atlantic. The policy blunders we lament of allowing credit booms to proceed way beyond sanity, of leaving vast areas of financial activity not just unregulated but even unmonitored, of building a unified Eurozone financial market without any unified regulatory standards, all these and more are the result of politics, of the power of the financial sector in all our countries to influence public policy in its own interests and to encourage complacency among both regulators and observers. 
This happened in the United States, in Britain, in Ireland, in Spain, in France, in Germany. The financial sector is not the only interest group to have gained disproportionate leverage over the democratic and public policy process. In all our countries, we can list a myriad of others, be they trade unions, professional associations, farmers, lobbies of all kinds. Mostly, democracy works by letting these groups duke it out and by means of periodic efforts by political parties to clear some of the blockages thereby caused in the democratic arteries of our body politic. To me, 2008 and the decade following have been a case on a simply grander and more devastating scale, a case that should illuminate the very processes of democracy that need our constant attention, but also a case that has put our democracies in the state of danger, dysfunctionality, and demoralization that I described earlier. This brings me back to the basic values of our liberal democratic societies that I described earlier. For those values, we can list many features, rule of law, freedom of speech and association, human rights, constitutional processes, and more. But together, they come down to two words, two guiding stars for our success, certainly over the past 75 years, but also in many respects over centuries. Those words are openness and equality. Openness is truly what has brought us the extraordinary good fortune that I began with. It is by our openness to new ideas, new people, new opportunities, new sources of competition, and general betterment that we've been able to continually push back scientific and technological frontiers and to continually reach new heights of welfare and well-being. That openness is disruptive, however. Throughout our history, it has brought changes that deprived some among us of our traditional livelihoods, of our cultural stability, of our communities. And that is why the societies that have truly embraced openness and have made, it a, made a success of it have embraced alongside it the other lodestar, equality. It is that lodestar of equality that has, has, in my view, been especially badly neglected in too many of our societies in recent decades. Some among you Maybe, maybe may have been wondering, as you were listening, whether you were believing what you were hearing. A former editor of The Economist, a devoutly free market journal, is talking to you about equality. When I was editor of The Economist, the Prime Minister of Italy, when we criticized him, did point out the well-known fact that we were a communist publication, uh, the e-communist. And his newspaper, Il Giornale, established this beyond dispute by publishing my picture on the front page and pointing out that I look like Lenin. <laughs> so clearly, I'm just going back to my origins. But not really. I haven't. What I mean by equality is not simply or even mainly a matter of income inequality. What I mean is a form of equality of which civility is an important part. That form of equality is political equality, an equality of political voice, rights, and participation. We can sum that, this up in the word citizenship. It has been the sense of this equal political participation that has maintained sufficient social trust for our societies to be able to absorb and adapt to the bracing winds of openness. The anger you saw in last year's presidential election that we Brits have just seen in our general election and that gave the far-right Marine Le Pen one-third of the vote in France's presidential elections recently is an anger about equality. But it's an anger best understood, in my view, as a perceived loss of citizenship, of open and equal participation. Our societies are perceived as having become less fair. Social mobility has declined. Education, especially in the best universities, has become too often an entrencher of inequality, not a ladder out of it. Opportunities are far from equal. And above all, the power of money, both in individual hands and that of giant corporations in politics, has increased spectacularly. 
The most important task of our times, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be that of redressing this negative trend towards political inequality, this trend towards societies in which citizens do not feel like citizens, and which both in politics and in the market systems, concentrations of power have grown to a distorting, damaging, and in fact, disabling level. Two great men of the past, neither of them communists, would have recognized this phenomenon especially clearly. One is an American, Theodore Roosevelt. His moves in, relation, in reaction to the Gilded Age and to monopolistic concentrations of power need to be learned from and emulated today. This does not just mean Google and Facebook, but also the wider trend of increased industrial consolidation that has occurred in this country and in others. The other great man who would recognize this phenomenon clearly is a Scotsman, a Scotsman who was writing at the time of the creation of your great country, namely Adam Smith. In 1776, as America became or was becoming the patron saint of modern democracy, so Adam Smith became the patron saint of free market economics with his great book, The Wealth of Nations. That book, however, needs always to be read alongside his earlier work, which was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. If published today, Adam Smith might have called that book The Theory of Civility. Smith was writing about, in that book, about what it is that binds us together successfully as societies. When indeed, those, our societies do succeed and keep themselves together, rather than disintegrating. What makes the difference between a well-bound together society and one that fractures? His wealth of nations, as is well known, exalted the virtues of free competition on the basis of self-interest, the so-called invisible hand, while saying that markets nevertheless need agreed sets of rules laid down by government, including ones of a trust-busting nature, to resist the natural tendency of business to collusion cartels and monopolies. They need a Teddy Roosevelt speaking softly but carrying a big stick. Adam Smith's moral sentiments framed this examination of the merit of selfishness with an examination of why human beings are not, in fact, solely selfish. He opens with this observation. No matter how selfish you think man is, it's obvious that there are some principles in his nature that give him an interest in the welfare of others and make their happiness necessary to him, even if he gets nothing from it but the pleasure of seeing it. That interest, served by a natural sense of empathy, has been framed in turn by our modern conception of citizenship amid equality before the law and equal and uh, political and civil rights. To Adam Smith, this natural moral sentiment could be seen expressed in three elements of what he saw as the virtuous character of mankind. Prudence, or a caution, an avoidance of recklessness. Justice, or a sense of acting with fairness without harming others. And beneficence, or a spirit of giving, to help others even when it is not required by law or by custom. Our Western societies have not, in other words, prospered by being, in the words of an English philosopher a century before Smith, Thomas Hobbes, by being a war of all against all, one in which, as Hobbes wrote, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Our Western societies have prospered by combining a remarkable and far-sighted openness with the sorts of moral principles envisaged by Adam Smith turned into political ones, empathy, prudence, justice, and beneficence, all expressed as equality. Competition is vital and hugely beneficial, but it cannot prosper on its own. In the face of angry electorates and the fear of decline, powerful voices in this country above all, but not only here, have called for various forms of the renunciation of openness, which would essentially mean the renunciation of full and free competition. I believe that to follow those calls would mean the end of the West and of our remarkable sustained success. The wiser option 
is to rebuild and repair equality, the sense of civility, empathy, and citizenship that gave us such enviable levels of social trust and stability in the past that act as a modifying, calming framework for competition. Equality, that is what Adam Smith would focus on, to heal our wounds, quell our anger, and give our liberal democratic societies their next lease of life. It can be done. It must be done. Let us do it all in our own ways. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I'm open to questions on an equal basis. Microphones are coming. Lady over here, microphone. Oh, I'll hold this microphone, yeah. Um, when and why did you decide that you must write this book? Because not only you, but our own uh, David McCullough also recently published a book which, you know, has to be taken serious in these difficult times. Uh, so just a little bit about that. Well, I basically, um, actually, I, I felt guilty about myself recently when I found an email that I'd sent someone saying I was writing a book about the, f the future of the West and the difficulties we were in, uh, and I was sure I would have it done by Christmas. And that was three years ago. So um, it's, it, uh, it took a long time, it took some time. But I, uh, I decided, because I felt the, vol the, the, the magnitude of what was happening, post the, the financial crisis particularly, um, and uh, was such that it needed explaining and connecting, I needed to understand it, uh, and it connected together so many countries uh, that also, to some degree, kind of represent my life in journalism in, and in writing, even as far as Japan, across to Europe and, and to North America, that these phenomena were, con were, were connected and that what I wanted to do was to try to understand it and put my arms around it. Uh, and uh, also to try to be part of the process of, of um, fighting the battle of ideas to protect the liberal values that uh, we, I think have made us successful. Uh, we all have to share our, our, the spirit of these things, uh, and that's, what I, that's why I did it. Sir? Thank you. Uh, you said that there is a lot of angry people. They are not sharing the same value. What can we do to illuminate this group of people all across the world to embrace the value of Adam Smith and the others? What is needed to bring those people to reacquire or understand the value that make the West a great success? I think it's a good question. I mean, I think it, basically uh, governments and societies of a whole have to deliver. They have to deliver a sense of participation and equality that groups who feel alienated and disillusioned um, have uh, lost. Now, I'm not naive about this. I think that at any time in, certainly in my lifetime, and any time probably in democratic history, there's always been groups who were, who were discontented in some way. But I think it's become a, of, a, of a scale that requires uh, a new attention. Uh, that's really what I'm saying. And that um, I think at each point in our progress as societies, we've brought people in, if you like, and helped them participate by Spirit, public spirited gestures that built a, a broader citizenship in, uh, of society, whether it was by extending the franchise or by investing in education, the GI Bill or the equivalent in, in uh, the UK, or um, by you know, welfare systems, the Great Society program that, uh, that uh, helped to, to, to heal some of the divisions um, in societies. Now, no, nothing is ever a final solution. Everything leads to new problems and then needs further repairing. But I think that we need that sort of uh, spirit today to try to um, heal some of this anger. And it's true in many countries. 
Uh, Apex in the front here, first of all. And then. Thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. Uh, the question I have is, I look upon you as in, in two ways. One as sort of an economist coming from the... Is that a compliment or a... <laughs> no, no, that's, that's certainly a compliment. It's, it's objectivity. I guess I'm looking for, just as we talk about systems and stability, systems and civility. I think that's one area. The other one is information. Looking at you as, as somebody who's been in the publishing business, there was something about veracity of information. There was information people could agree upon to some extent. I think we've come to a point where we don't agree upon at all in terms of information. Information is spreading like wildfire. And, and this is a global problem, not just a problem in the West. So how do we deal with that? That's a difficult one. Um, I think, I mean, I agree with you that the the veracity of information is vital. I mean, I feel that, you know, in the magazine I worked for, that the essential test of whether or not it would survive or die was always about veracity of information. It was the, the information we gave credible, was it reliable, uh, could it be believed, and, and only then, if it could be, would, did anyone pay any attention to the opinions that, uh, that uh, the publication uh, made offered on the basis of that information, uh, and that we would be basically dead if we, uh, if we showed ourselves to be unreliable. Now, I think that, is, that publication is continuing to thrive, but it's 1.6 million people uh, a week now, um, but it's never, that's rather a small number compared with the, the universe that you're describing. Um, but I think that there is still, and, and that's increasingly, a place and a market for that kind of journalism and, and information based on that credibility, and I think people are, are very interested in that. But what, I think two things have happened. One is that actually people's access to information has increased hugely and their expectations about information have changed, and that has uh, kind of, or, uh, um, or perhaps it's made, it more, made the availability more universal in a way that uh, was never there before, uh, and that therefore also, perceptions of the information is more fragmented. But secondly, television, which was a kind of binding force. Um, certainly in my country, the BBC was, was the, 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 at least the common agenda. Uh, like it or not, hate it or not, it was the common agenda. And now we've fragmented uh, because of the multiplicity of sources of information. Now, I don't think we should overstate this problem. I think that... Uh, uh, Multiplicity means that you can double check and so forth, and that actually maybe it's not as, as divisive as we sometimes think, but nevertheless, the, the task to, of establishing uh, media companies and media flows that um, are believed uh, to be have the, as their basic agenda, the veracity of information and a sharing of the conversation um, on a large enough scale is a big task that I think uh, companies have to follow, but also communicators, you know, writers and broadcasters and so forth have to think about that, I think. Um, that niches are great, but um, what about all the rest? That's the thing. So. Yeah, I <clears throat> wonder if you could uh, comment on the extreme polarization that has paralyzed government's ability to deal with the kinds of issues that you mention and uh, perhaps uh, answer the question, is it necessary to somehow ameliorate that polarization, and if so, how? <laughs> I might pass on that one, yes. It's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, we are, I, I, it is a common problem to a degree that we are uh, uh, more polarized than we were before in many Western countries, I think. Um, but, but I think in most Western countries, it's been a product of the, of the, of the economic and, and financial crisis that has built the polarization, whereas I'm not sure that that would be the, the sufficient explanation in, uh, in the United States of that, of that polarization. Um, I mean, I... 
I do think, though, I mean, think that trying to formulate an answer, I think that the financial crisis has played a role in, in even here in deepening that polarization, partly because it so swamped the abilities of anyone who was trying to be in some way bipartisan or connecting together, um, such as I believe Barack Obama would have, would have thought of himself in that way, whether rightly or wrongly. Uh, but he arrives in office with the financial crisis raging around his ears and um, you know, having a really uh, um, being the, the predominant task of his, of his first, several year, you know, first couple of years and thereby would be unable to, to act. So maybe there are going to be future tests in future of, peop of people in a more benign situation who might be able to provide some bipartisanship and to reduce the polarization. But as you can tell, I don't have an answer. Are we, oh yeah. uh, how do you deal with the hate that's in this country? There, this country has so much I'm better than you, or us against them. And it seems that that mounts. Uh, I have my own feelings about how that has been capitalized on. But it is a fact, OK, that it's one thing to call it political polarization and uh, extreme uh, partisanship. But that can only exist because people are elected who go in certain directions. And so much of what allows differences, in my opinion, is predicated on hate and the ability of people to capitalize on that to produce the results that they would like to produce. So. How do you deal with not only uh, negotiating with that, but changing hate? That might be a task for a priest rather than me. But <laughs> nevertheless, I, I mean, to be more serious about it, I do think that it's, it's essentially uh, uh, the, the extent of it, because I appreciate that it's not, it's not a new phenomenon. The extent of it is a response to stress, if you like. The stress, the financial and economic stress that, that then means it's there for politicians to exploit uh, or, for, or for forces of different kinds to exploit, not just politicians. Um, just as um, in France, uh, the, the far right Marine Le Pen has, and if I exploited fear and exploited anger um, and blamed foreigners and and, and access, accentuated some of the, that stress. Uh, so it's a, I, I think the basic, aren't the only, the only sensible answer I can think of is that you have to try to get the sources of the stress reduced. Uh, and I do believe that it's, it's gonna be there, maybe I am a Marxist, it's all economics. Um, but it is in, it, it has to be in the, in the, in the delivery and the performance of the, of the society and the economy and reducing the desire to find someone else to blame. That's really it. Um, that's really it. And that's the, that's the danger of the time we're in, that uh, the temptation is to find someone else to blame, whether they are somebody different in your own society or somebody across the border or some somebody of a different religion or whatever it is. And that's, I agree with you, it's a very dangerous phenomenon. Uh, I noticed you you spent a lot of time in Japan. And I wonder if there's any uh, special uh, significant, or it, whether Japan is a special case. I, I'm thinking of, of one thing, on, on the one side there's a demographic crisis that it's facing. And on the other hand, there's a, one could say an excess of civility in their, in their culture. I guess I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Yes, no, that's a good that's a good way of looking at it. Um, I once published a cover of uh, the Economist, which was um, during their financial crisis of the 1990s, and the government was really manifestly failing to respond at dealing with the banking crisis and others. And the cover I put on said the title was Japan's amazing ability to disappoint. Words, to fail to, to, to do the right thing. And a um, leading senator, I mean, a Japanese politician from the upper house, uh, said to me at a meeting afterwards, he said, you know, I, 
I saw your cover, but you got it wrong, Emmett San. You got it wrong, he said. The cover really should have said the Japanese people's amazing ability not to be disappointed. Um, and that's the problem. They're too civil. <laughs> and, uh, and I do think that some of the, uh, that there is something to that, that they are too conformist and consensual to uh, be disruptive, if you like, in their own, in their own interest. Um, on the other hand, they did have their po a, a, a populist landslide, earthquake, if you like, uh, in politics, when finally they, they lost patience and got disappointed. In 2009, they threw out the long-standing ruling party, the Liberal Democrats, and elected um, center-left party, the Democratic Party of Japan, uh, in the hope of shaking all sorts of things up. Uh, and um, they really swept the board, but they were too new. Maybe this is a lesson for uh, Emmanuel Macron in France. They were too naive in a way. They made enemies of the bureaucracy, which they needed to actually get onto their side to make things happen. Um, and uh, then, unfortunately, the 2011 tsunami and nuclear accident happened, and they were overwhelmed by that. So they, Japan did have after a very long time of patience and, and uh, civility, uh, the landslide, but then disillusion set in, particularly after the, two, the uh, nuclear accident and uh, so forth, which was a mixture, could be, I mean, apart from the natural part of it, the, the nuclear part of it was a mixture of simply collusion and um, crony capitalism, in other words, Nick, um, over deliberately over overlooking neglect of the safety procedures and of uh, the, the correct ways to defend the this the site um, and uh, um, a sort of uh, how shall I call it so a, a collusion and maybe a, a, a an unwillingness to rock the boat to uh, to to stand up and say something was wrong so I think that there is there's something in what you say, but they do share more of the, the rest of, the, of our phobias and difficulties that, uh, than, than one thinks. Um, and uh, the demography, is a, as you say, is a particular shared thing, that um, America has a much better demo demographic structure than Japan, but Japan's is very similar to Italy's, similar to Germany's, similar to some parts of Scandinavia. So uh, we have to learn from each other and on those issues. Two more questions. Could you comment, please, on thank you? Uh, could you comment, please, on the impact of central bank policies and procedures on income and financial equality and inequality? Yes, I think that um, central banks, uh, by quantitative easing, printing money, enormously expanding their balance sheets, uh, made a necessary intervention to uh, support the financial system, to maintain liquidity and to deal with what was essentially a, pr a problem analogous to the 1930s uh, that, uh, that uh, really needed uh, rescuing. But this had a side effect because what they did was inflate asset markets um, by that and the asset markets accentuated in income inequality and wealth inequality. So I do think that they, their action had the side effect of suppressing what might have been a reduction in inequality in that period, or in some places where it inflated asset markets, it expanded some of the inequality. But I don't think I can blame them for that. They, they were there as kind of as an emergency service rather than um, as a kind of fundamental um, improvers of, our, uh, of, of, of structures of our society. So I think that it is... Uh, um, a side effect, though, uh, and of course they've they've carried on with the quantitative easing much longer than they would ever have expected or wanted, really. Um, uh, and I, but I do think that it that it had that sort of phenomenon, that sort of effect. So, to Joe to choose the final question. <laughs> Thank you. If there is some miracle, uh, you found yourself prime minister. Uh, with a very solid majority, what f three, four, five policies would you enact uh, right away? 
You mean of the, of the United Kingdom? Yes. Okay. Well, the first thing I would do would be to um, uh, announce that we were going to um, rejoin the European Union. Um, because I would have argued to my countrymen and countrywomen that uh, we'd really been conned by a, um, a, a coup d'etat in the Conservative Party, uh, and that um, leaving our neighbours and our great strategic partners was a big mistake. So that would be number one. Number two, I think I would um, really try to uh, divert more money to education and higher education as well, uh, that in a way that... Um, Dealt, tried to demonstrably deal with perceived barriers to social mobility and, uh, and uh, progress. Um, three, I would um, break up big banks. I would be much more aggressive in the um, uh, reaction to and policy against um, the uh, what I see as the excessive power in the City of London and some of the really big financial institutions we have. We have both a quite monopolistic or oligopolistic retail banking sector, but also these uh, the sort of some the massive institutions that have posed a big risk over our market. And I think I would be more aggressive on that. Um, I would do more. I would also announce that I was uh, intervening further, and here people will really think I've gone mad, um, intervening further in the wage market, in minimum wages, to raise uh, the, minimum, the statutory minimum wage, um, because in our current conditions, we could do that without being likely to cause unemployment. Uh, and that that evening up of the, of the, of the, wage curve um, was, would be likely to have a larger effect than anything else on uh, both boosting consumer demand and helping the economy but, and dealing with perceptions of inequality uh, and um, people's suspicion and worry about immigration as competing on their, on their incomes. Uh, there is a difficulty with that uh, policy, which I would have to face up to as Prime Minister, which is that uh, one of the biggest employers of minimum wage staff is the public sector, so that you immediately raise your own costs if you do that. So that there is that, that's one reason why it doesn't happen as much as, as it should, but the previous British government did push up the minimum wage quite a bit, and I think it's necessary, and I think it's absolutely necessary in this country. I applaud what California is doing and actually New York uh, in pushing up the statutory minimum wage because I think it's an important part of ameliorating some of the, the situation that we all our economies find ourselves in. Would you re-elect me? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Emmett, and we will see you in September. <laughs>